prize-winning press photography in a Mediterranean villa, socially distanced performances start here in Paris, and Avignon streets seem strangely bereft during a summer without its theatre festival. Well, that's all coming up on today's edition of Encore. We're kicking off the show with a selection of images that documents a decade of award-winning photojournalism. The Carmignac family here in France owns a vast collection of masterpieces, ranging from Basquiat's to Botticelli's, but in 2009 they decided to set up a prize to support the visual storytellers of the 21st century. They're now exhibiting the work of the winners over the last 10 years, and our reporters Clovis Casale and Juliette Montilly headed to the Carmignac Villa on the island of Porquerolles to find out more. Contemplating the pictures he commissioned, this year's winner of the Carmignac Prize, Finbar O'Reilly, should have gone to the Democratic Republic of Congo to complete his project. But the outbreak of COVID-19 prevented him from traveling, so he asked local photographers to document the ongoing conflict and health crisis. The circumstances that encouraged us to do this were, you know, unfortunate, but what it has created is an opportunity for this kind of work, which is much more collaborative, including um, voices and perspectives of the journalists who live in the countries that we report on, rather than always having the foreigner coming in and imposing their perspective. So initially we just said like photograph around your house, your neighborhood. So this picture by Arlette is of her little sister uh, studying at home during a power cut. It was really just a question of, you know, seeing what the issues were around um, the areas where the photographers live and, and work. Previous winners of the award are celebrated in this exhibition. Projects from Zimbabwe, Iran, or Libya, all on display at the Garmignac Villa, located here on the Mediterranean island of Borquerolles. The venue is a hidden gem in a preserved national park. The foundation says it wants to help photojournalists from around the world who inform the public in a different way. These photojournalists delve into different aspects of life, terrible examples of slavery, war and oppression. It's one side of us, of mankind. On the other hand, we see a level of courage from some of the people who are photographed. They show astounding vitality in hard living conditions. The photographers demonstrate courage too. Lizzie Sadin had to hide her camera when she investigated women trafficking in Nepal in 2017. She wanted to give victims a voice. Rita fell into the typical trap set by traffickers, like many other women in Nepal. In their villages, you have relatives or people they know, men and women, who choose them because they're poor and promise them a job or money. These victims accept and find themselves locked and trapped in brothels, raped and working 16 to 20 hours a day. Winners of the prize get support from the foundation for a whole year. It helps ease financial pressure, giving photojournalists the time and means to achieve their projects. Their pictures are a window on the world bringing to the public stories rarely told. After months of lockdown, people are tentatively returning to cultural venues here in Paris. But with rehearsals stopped and shows cancelled, theatres are scrambling to come up with creative ways to stage performances safely. At the Théâtre de la Colline, in the east of the French capital, they're starting off slowly with a new version of director Wajdi Mawad's play Littoral. Samia Mateni and Chris Moore went to check it out. In the hills of eastern Paris, La Colline one of the capital's four national theatres is reopening its doors. And on one of the many outdoor terraces that have sprung up since lockdown, there's anticipation. It's a real pleasure. We are really excited. This is a fantastic place. Normally I see eight or nine shows a week. So going from that to nothing was a real loss. The reopening of theatres and culture means we can all be together again. And we're no longer prisoners to our basic conditions. France has been lifting restrictions bit by bit, and with the cinemas and museums also open, the country's cultural life is returning, albeit with strict rules still in place. We've organised it so that the audience arrives gradually. The auditorium opens an hour before the performance. 
The public have to wear masks as they make their way to their seats, but they can take them off once the play starts. There's one spare seat in between each group of spectators. The first performance, a revisiting of director Wajdi Mouad's Littoral, a switch of programme brought about by lockdown. The piece deals with loss and mourning as an orphan seeks to bury their father in his homeland. Hayat Darwich plays Simone, who's also in grieving. I was really emotional and I didn't understand why. But it's because of the exceptional circumstances. What shocked me most about the lockdown was not being able to mourn our dead, not having ceremonies. Coming back with Littoral now makes so much sense. We've added to the original with the names of our dead. There were so many of them. And we want the living to remember. An appropriate choice as France's theatres tentatively reopen their doors with fingers crossed for the future. Staying with theatre, the city of Avignon is dealing with the reality of a summer without its usual sense of spectacle after the cancellation of its annual theatre festival. The news came as a serious blow to the organisers of the internationally renowned event, as well as the local businesses who rely on the crowds who flock to Provence for the festival every year. It also means that theatre companies will have to find other ways to showcase their work and to sell their plays to agents for the upcoming cultural season. Solange Mougin has more. A near deserted esplanade in front of the Palais des Papes. There are the cicadas, but the calls of roaming actors are absent. The cancellation of this year's Festival of Avignon has metamorphosized long-held traditions here. Alors normalement, c'est très différent. Vous avez It's usually very different. You would have a floor covering the entire courtyard, with this area here being used as a stage and this one for the bleachers. Is it strange to see the great courtyard like this right now? It's a first, a sad one. The palace generally does a million euros in sales in July, but with no festival and the coronavirus, visitors are sorely wanting. We can't make up for events that did not occur. We can hope that future events in the month and years to come will be more normal, but we don't know. In the streets, the absence of live performances gives the normally vibrant city a sleepy feel. The bustle of 1,500 shows and one million visitors seems from a bygone era. For Anne-Lise Bernard, there may be hard times ahead. Her bed and breakfast is usually fully booked, but now reservations are few and far between. We went from 100% revenue to 30%. So yes, it's going to be difficult to pay our bills, taxes, the accountant. Every new reservation brings a little hope to Benoit Colioni. The month of July with the festival usually represents 30% of his restaurant's annual sales. Normally the terrace is packed, especially at this hour, but as you can see, we're almost empty. It's going to be a surprise. We're just trying to make it the least unpleasant surprise possible. For Serge Barbusia, there's no need to look at the numbers. They're at zero. The theatre director relies on the festival to finance his theatre and to sell his plays to tour for the coming year. Ça nous permet de... It allows us to work for the entire year. It isn't the festival alone, but it does help us have a permanent staff and work all year here in the theatre. The Festival of Avignon is France's largest market for theatre. Before the pandemic, 20% of the nation's plays were sold there. To Canada now, where one venue has managed to stage an artistic experience with built-in social distancing. The drive-in format has been much discussed as a solution for watching movies en masse amid a global pandemic, and that system's now been tweaked to accommodate an immersive exhibition too. In a world first, the work of painter Vincent van Gogh has been brought to life with some digital expertise. Here's what the organisers had to say about it. 
So drive-in is, is pretty neat because you've never had an experience like this in your car. Uh, of course, you have your own environment, so if you're concerned about safety, uh, it's superior. Um, you sit inside the car, the projections are on your car, they're on the car beside you, and the feeling is almost as if the car is floating through the arc. We're in a situation where everyone is uh, you know, exhausted with staying at home. They saw the value in creating something for the public to come out to. Uh, they saw the value in the arts continuing. So um, it was work, we had to figure everything out. But no, every, everybody involved from the mayor of the city downwards was involved and wanted to help make it happen. And we're wrapping up the show by taking you from the sunflower fields of Provence to the snow-capped peaks of Mount Fuji. Japan's sacred mountain is the highest point in the country, and as well as its spiritual significance, it's also been a source of inspiration for artists throughout the centuries. The Musée Guimé here in Paris is hosting an exhibition that explains how Hokuzai's prints from the 18th century spawned a graphic craze for the summit. We'll leave you with a preview of that show. Otherwise, do check in with us here on Encore for more arts and culture, and there's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. Thank <laughs> you.